that question. But go ahead. <laughs> I'm <not> probably not. <laughs> um, so when you're talking about uh, smart grid technology and something you guys both seem to reference a few times, it seems to me you're talking about uh, a more decentralized approach to power. Distributed. Power. Distributed, exactly. And I was wondering, I wanted to ask Rob if you, what's, it, se it seems like that sort of approach, um, and, and if, you, if you transfer that same idea to, to vehicles and to different fuel sources and um, this sort of thing, it seems like it, 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 it will be difficult. It's difficult for me to imagine Chevron existing in that world uh, without being a, a smaller, sort of uh, having a smaller place in that world. And I was wondering what your perspective on that, obviously that's not something that would be appealing to Chevron, and so what? I don't know about smaller. It's an, okay. That's an interesting question. Is I, I think if, if by smaller you mean is the fuel mix going to look different? And we're going to have plug-in hybrids, or we're going to have full electrics, or we're going to have a series of different components. I, I think the answer to that is yes. Now we may, as a company, we, I mean, we're, we're one of the few companies that spend a lot of time on hydrogen, for example. We just think hydrogen's not there yet. It's not going to be there for 15, 20 years. We still think it's a problem for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and you can you can make hydrogen, you can distribute it, you can do a lot of things with it, but you've got a very expensive platform, for example. But if you mean that in terms of the liquid component of our business, sure, that's going to be smaller. Our, it's going to be what it is today, for, for, perhaps for the foreseeable future, but it's certainly not going to grow significantly. And we're going to see all these other components continue to add value as, as our energy demand continues to develop. They're going to be the more dominant portions of that. Our perspective is we will we will be there uh, where it's appropriate for us uh, in adding value and being part of that mix. And so I don't know that we, we that our emphasis as a corporation and our value of being an energy company changes, but the markets in which we we work those issues and how we participate financially or in, in terms of development of technology, I don't think that changes for us. So the way well, I think what Dustin is getting at, is if I may editorialize. Correct me if I'm wrong. That in the music business, it's radically there's a radical upheaval in a decade because of distributed music breaking down old uh, centralized production and distribution companies that were looked at as going for a hundred years have disappeared in the face of downloading of music. So it may not be appropriate for the oil and gas business, but it may be important for the utilities and the centralized uh, distributors of generation and distributed, uh, distributed power. That upheaval may happen, but it won't happen overnight, will it? No, it won't happen. It won't happen overnight. It'll be it'll be a very progressive exercise, but over an extended period of decades. I mean, we're all moving that direction. Some of us, some of us will be anxious to move as quickly as possible, but uh, it certainly won't. Happen. I want to ask Anthony and Josh here for a second. If you were the uh, President Obama, just gave a speech last week at MIT on his energy policies. If you were writing that speech, and you don't have it in front of you, I do, but if you were writing that speech, what would be the opening paragraph? What would be one or two of the points that you'd want to have the, the president emphasize? You want to start there? Sure. I, I just I want to feed off of what Anthony said about, about buying solar panels from China and the, the carbon footprint that leaves behind. It's interesting. When we get into these conversations about energy, we get so timid. You know, nobody talks about the carbon footprint of your iPod. I do. What? Okay. <laughs> well, what about the carbon footprint but, of your water bottle? You know, the water bottle. You, you, don't, you don't see a lot of online discussions about the carbon footprint of your Blackberry or your, your diapers for your kid. Or, you know, it, it, it becomes this didactic trap that we put ourselves in where we, we, we're so committed to that the next generation of energy be perfect that we do nothing. You know, we won't buy the solar panel. Well, maybe it was made in China, so on the carbon footprint. I don't know, I'll just leave it on the shelf. And, and it's funny because if you look at the stuff in your life, the majority of anything that's made in plastic mold that comes from China. But you don't go to the store and go, God, I don't know. You know, I was thinking about getting a video camera, but I'm not gonna, because it's got such a huge carbon footprint. It becomes weird when you, when you start getting into energy conversation. It's like people don't want to do anything. And the reality is the U.S. manufacturing and development sector for these technologies that we need, the plug-in technology for our cars, the plug-in technology for our houses to make our houses part of an intelligent grid, even the manufacturing stuff, a lot of it, that's coming for the renewable energy sector for liquid fuels, for biofuels, so much of that's coming from overseas. So Josh, if you had to give the speech in Ohio, 
that have to deal with jobs in the economy. I well, what's the first paragraph of this? Paper? The first paragraph would be buy the stuff. Doesn't matter where it comes from. If it comes from China, I don't think Ohio is where you want to make this. <laughs> we, just, we just went to Youngstown, Ohio, and, and I gave a presentation in Youngstown to the Rust Belt to these former auto workers. I said part of the reason why you're so, you know, your economy is in, in, in shambles and it's shattered is because there is not just a lack of innovation, there is a lack of will. And at some stage, you have got to get off your ass and buy products and look at them and go, gee, it was made in China. Can we make this in Youngstown, Ohio? Can we make this in Los Angeles, California, in you know Simi Valley, where they wash trucks and do all that industrial stuff that no one checks on in terms of emissions regulations anyway? It, you have got to make some bold <laughs> movements <laughs> forward. And, and the, reality is, the reality is, if we wait for America to produce it and buy it, we're going to be waiting a long time. You know, I want you to report he's a free trader. <laughs> I am. We, we have got to start to embrace, to embrace a true free market and a true cross-cultural, cross-national foreign market where we bring in other products and we now have to do what Asia did after the Second World War. Okay, we I have to Anthony. study those Correct. and learn how to make them. Anthony, what's your writing? And we're back to the speech. Now. Um, well, I think that um, Obama got it pretty right, um, at least you know rhetorically. The, the, what it really comes down to is uh, uh, giving the consumer uh, the full array of choices that the consumer uh, could be provided. Um, whether that's for your transportation or for your stationary power, uh, what have you, you know, as I think you were alluding to, the consumer really doesn't have a lot of choices right now. Um, some of that has been as a result of a, of a concerted strategy by, you know, we don't have public transportation uh, as great as we could have it in the state of California because uh, the Firestone Tire Company and General Motors and the Standard Oil Company in California bought up the, the, the <laughs> public transportation in the, in the end of the 1930s, ripped it out uh, as part of a strategy. Okay, and you know, Alfred P. Sloan, the guy who invented that strategy, is who the MIT Business School is named after. Okay, it's, huh. that is what you do when you're building a business. You, you, you try and uh, maximize your competitive advantage. Um, what we need to do right now is to give is to give every uh, American consumer the chance to maximize their own competitive advantage in terms of making the best choices for themselves. Uh, when you can buy, uh, when you have a real choice between the types of fuel that you fuel your car with, uh, then you have the power. Uh, you know, we right now there is no such thing as energy independence, right? There's, I I have never imported one gallon of fuel from any terrorist state, ever. Okay, I don't go into my local Chevron station and say, you know what, give me three gallons of Saudi and four of Venezuelan for a chop chop. You know, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. Okay, we get it from where we get it, and where it is is from the cheapest producer possible.